Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mark Zitter, the chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the club's Board of Governors, and your moderator for this evening. Tonight's program is entitled, A Bipartisan Approach to Healthcare Reform. Now these days, it's fairly rare to hear the words bipartisan and healthcare in the same sentence, unfortunately. But it's because of this bitter debate that we've had about the passage of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, and subsequent attempts to repeal it. That has made healthcare reform really ground zero in what's already a pretty bitter national ideological battleground. That in and of itself is frustrating to Americans of both parties who believe that healthcare is just too important to be a political punching bag. Early in 2018, many well-known leaders across the American healthcare spectrum joined forces to launch the United States of Care, a bipartisan initiative to ensure access to quality, affordable health care for all Americans. The founding belief is that when politics are put aside, Americans agree more than they disagree about health care access and coverage. This nonprofit organization seeks politically and economically viable solutions that can garner broad support that won't disappear with the next election or the next presidential administration. The group's board and founders council reads like a who's who in American healthcare, and we're fortunate to have with us tonight several members of the group for tonight's discussion. I will now introduce our panelists. On my immediate left is Andy Slavitt. Andy was the acting administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the Obama administration, also known as CMS. And he's also the founder and board chair of the United States of Care. He arguably was the Democrats' standard bearer in last year's bitter fight uh, that involved repealing uh, or attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Andy is senior advisor to the Bipartisan Policy Center and is a member of that organization's Future of Healthcare Initiative. He's got decades of experience in both the private and the public sector in healthcare, business, and technology, and has been recognized as one of the 10 most influential people in healthcare. Next to Andy is Senator David Dernberger, who served as senior U.S. Senator from Minnesota from 1978 through 1995. He was a Republican while in office and has since become an independent. He has been involved. Yeah, there's some reasons for that. <laughs> okay. We're nonpartisan here at the Commonwealth Club, remember? You already have a fan club. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> He's been involved in every presidential and congressional health policy reform since then, starting with President Carter's. Senator Dernberger played a major leadership role in national health care reform while he was in the Senate. For example, he was a sponsor of the Medicare Catastrophic Act, uh, AHCPR, now the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Americans with, for, with Disabilities Act, and many other laws. He served as the chairman of the National Institute of Health Policy at the University of St. Thomas until his retirement in 2014. Next, Dr. Sandra Hernandez, president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation and assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. The California Healthcare Foundation seeks to improve healthcare for all Californians with a particular focus on low income and vulnerable residents. Dr. Hernandez previously served for 16 years as the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, and prior to that, as Director of Public Health for the City and County of San Francisco, where she co-chaired San Francisco's Universal Healthcare Council. And finally, our final panelist is Judy Rich, who is CEO of the Tucson Medical Center, a nonprofit regional hospital in Tucson, Arizona. It has been named by Thomson Reuters as one of the top 50 cardiovascular hospitals in the United States. She began her career as a hospital staff nurse and progressed to leadership positions at the center, including chief operating officer prior to her being named CEO in 2007. So that's our panel. We have panelists who have been active in democratic and Republican politics and those representing patients and the healthcare industry. Please help me welcome our wonderful panel. Okay, I've got some questions for all of you, and I'm sure we'll get from some from the audience as well. And Andy, I'm going to start with you, because of course you, as uh, the acting administrator of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, were responsible in part for helping to implement the Affordable Care Act. 
Then you spent a lot of time when you left that office uh, defending it and trying to help it survive uh, against uh, attempts to repeal it. And then you decided to start the United States of Care. So I'm obviously curious to see why you did that and what you hope to accomplish. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. And thanks for having us. And congratulations on this great new facility. Uh, so let me just dispense with this for, at the beginning. I don't know that there is a bipartisan solution to health care. There, there probably isn't right now. But what there is, actually, are people around the country, some of whom self-identify as Democrats, some of whom self-identify as Republicans, some of whom self-identify as politically independent or not at all, who basically want some fundamental things from the health care system that our politics aren't delivering for them. And, you know, I'm reminded of this based upon kind of this sort of question of how do we in this country and how should we in this country think about what we owe people from the healthcare system. There was a conversation with a former prime minister of Australia who made the following observation. He said, you know, the one thing, we really admire the US in a lot of ways, but the one thing that really puzzles us is you seem to have this attitude around healthcare where you leave most of your citizens in a state of quiet desperation. <laughs> that they just never know if something happens, if they get sick, uh, whether they're going to be able to afford their medicine, afford their health care. And we're not perfect in Australia, but we try to take some basic things off the table. And it's kind of curious to us that you don't. And from our, from our perspective, health care is what, and, and be, being able to access health care coverage is what keeps people in the middle class. Without it, we don't have a middle class life. And if you're not able to care for your family when something happens, if you're not able to, to keep your family healthy, then you fundamentally can't live the kind of life that you need and you want to live. And so we fail our country. We have failed for generations to solve this problem. And now we've made progress over time, and I think we've made progress with the Affordable Care Act. But the question is, what's next and how are we going to get there? And are we going to get there in a way that reflects the needs and values of the American public, which, by the way, I think are very consistent. They suggest that people do feel that all Americans should be able to take care of their families. They do believe that people should be able to afford their medications, that they should see a doctor when they need to, and that they should never have to choose between a medical expense and some other expense. So with, that, with those parameters, I think uh, the idea to say, we're probably not going to have health care reform during the Trump years. Let's just kind of face that fact. But we do need to start now if we want to ever get where we want to go. And I think there's energy all over the country representing all kinds of ideas um, that we need to capitalize and move forward with. And I think our goal in bringing this organization together is really to overwhelm the politics of the moment, play the long game, and eventually build a country that's worthy of its people. Can you say a word about how you hope to do that? It's sure. nice to have this organization. You have a lot of impressive people. What are you going to do? Sure. Well, look, I think there are important rays of hope. Uh, one of the rays of hope is that the American public has decided how they feel about this issue. 75% of Republicans and 85% of Democrats basically believe in the principles that I laid out. Now, we, as often happens, we have the American public feeling one way and Washington not quite responsive. So this happens to have happened on, say, marriage equality, where for a long time it took the public getting there before Washington ever came along. It happens, it's happening with regard to marijuana legalization. It's happening uh, with regard to gun safety. It does, but it doesn't really translate into political victory until you catalyze those views and, and get to do the hard work of passing policies, of organizing at the grassroots level, and of building uh, new ideas and policies together that can unite people and can, can bring people together. So that is a broad mandate, uh, and it is a broad mandate of both ideas and gra grassroots activism and policy work. So I think it's going to be a, a lot of that, and principally today, because of the state of affairs in Washington, it's going to mean working in states to help pass legislation, regulations and things in states that help move us closer and they could eventually become models for what we do in Washington. And I would just, before I close, I would just say, you know, it took a Romney care mm -hmm. for there to be an Obamacare. And, and it will take 
so I think we can use some of these intervening years before we have the ability to do something at a national level and really see if we can make models work at the state level and then try to make them work at a national level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Senator Dernberger, you've obviously had a lot of history both in the Senate and since then looking at the political situation. Why do you feel that this organization might be able to make a dent in the healthcare uh, sets of issues uh, in, in this particularly politi bitter political environment? Because I spent so much of my career in both politics and in elected office doing something about changing the healthcare system. And I know that it doesn't deserve to be in politics. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a noble uh, desire. <laughs> How do you think this organization, the United States of Care, may be able to make some progress? Yeah, I, I, I'll just do a quick elaboration on, okay. on my short comment, but, <laughs> but um, the reality is that the only thing harder to take for an American today than a president who lies, who makes it uh, his job to make people feel less valued by other people and, you know, take down opposition in the way that he does, and we all know it so well, is having two of the nation's major political parties, the Republican and the Democratic Party, politicizing an issue that is so dear, as we've already expressed, to every single American as this. They don't understand the health care system. They understand they're part of it. They understand what they hear about it or what they might experience by working somewhere in it. But they don't, they don't, they can't put the politics of this together with what's the right policy and how is it going to affect me. The only place you can do that, and this is the problem with these parties, mm -hmm. the, the Republican Party no longer represents Minnesota. It's a national party. The Democratic Party, I can't speak for them because I'm not a member, but, you know, no longer speaks for Minnesota. You know, it speaks for a, a, a there's a national audience for this party now, and they play for it. And that's a series of, of campaigns and the way the campaigns are connected that give you that. What that means is that there are 50 states in America, all very different, all very different, different set of values, um, and 3,140 counties or communities that are not heard from in the political system. Mm -hmm. They're heard from in their states, they're heard from in a county or some, in a community, but they're not heard from at the national level. And that's why when Andy came to me and said, I want to take politics out of healthcare, it resonated with me immediately. Sure. I'm still trying to figure out how do you take politics out of health care? Clearly, well, you start you want to politicize it. Right. You start yeah. where, where the politicians are the closest to the people. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can't get away. If you're a state legislator, you can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I don't think you take politics out of health care. I think right. you, beat, you beat the politicians right. into understanding where the American, American people are. And we have, we have gaps for reasons that we all know. Gerrymandering, redistricting, money in politics, lots yeah. of reasons why today we, our representatives don't represent us. Mm -hmm. I know I traveled around the country last year as part of trying to defeat the ACA repeal to find that only seven Republicans were willing to hold town halls across the entire country to explain their vote. So I traveled around the country to help, explain, help, help them, assist them very kindly to explain their vote to their constituents. <laughs> People don't feel represented. People don't feel represented by this issue. So what, what we mean when we say the health care should, should supersede politics is, is that the politics that are driving politicians today in Washington are the things that get them elected to committees, things that give them uh, chairmanships of committee, things that help them, them raise national money. They're not the things that people care about. So we've got to change that. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we will never get there. So it seems that the state level may offer some uh, greater opportunities. So Sandra, you're head of a foundation that's focused only on one state, on California, right. a particular emphasis on, on low income and, and uh, residents and those who aren't well served by the current system. So you're involved with the United States of Care. What do you think the organization should do first and how can it be likely to succeed in that regard? Well, I, I would say a couple things. First, um, 
uh, one of the things that Andy mentions is that you, I don't think you can take politics out of healthcare, but I do think you can infuse it with a strong public sentiment and infuse it as well with data and evidence from the voices of people throughout uh, the country and certainly uh, throughout California. And lifting up that voice we think is incredibly important as a foundation. We also think it's incredibly important to use data and evidence to drive good policy, to evaluate experimentations and innovations. Um, and fundamentally, um, we also have an affordability problem. And a lot of what gets politicized today in this country is how to address that and how you diagnose that and what's the ideology of it and uh, how can you address that for the average American or the average Californian. And that affordability issue is one about cost of care and really understanding the cost of care and what drives that and what provides value and what doesn't is very much what the work of the California Healthcare Foundation is about. Um, as Andy said, it's a long game. Um, California has done a tremendous job in ACA implementation by all measures. We could talk more about that. Um, is it perfect? No. Does it need improvements? Absolutely. Um, but everybody also looks at California and says, what have we learned and uh, what, what's being evolved and what are you working on next? And so we think we have a responsibility to participate in that conversation nationally. Uh, to share what we've learned, to learn from other states, uh, but importantly to keep a public dialogue about um, the issues around affordability at the forefront, because we think ultimately for all of these public programs to be sustainable, we have to get at that issue. Mm -hmm. And affordability is obviously related to the total cost of the system That's right. as well, and the total cost of the system is related to coverage, because it would be a lot easier to cover everyone if we could afford it better. Well, and California has done an amazing job on coverage mm -hmm. um, uh, with Medicaid expansion and with a very viable uh, uh, individual market exchange covered California. Uh, we've taken our uninsured rate down to close to 7%. Mm -hmm. um, we're not done, but it is certainly within reach. Uh, and so I think getting to universal coverage is one part of what we are working on. And as I said, California has made great strides in that. Um, the exchange did an extraordinary job of recruiting a very big risk pool. Uh, it's a very viable exchange. It's had very modest increase in premiums. And our Medicaid program is an extraordinary program. It covers 13 million Californians. Um, again, uh, a lot of improvements that we're working on. We need more accountability. We need more transparency on data. We need to understand dashboards and be more committed to quality measures. Um, but we think the groundwork for uh, reaching universal coverage and a sustainable, affordable system is within reach in the country, and we're certainly doing our best in California to get us there. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Judy, I want to hear from you. You're here to represent healthcare organizations, which I know is a tall order since hospital systems are pretty different from drug companies and insurers and so forth. But be that as it may, um, many people think that the healthcare industry is part of the problem. Some people think it's the problem that we have, right? And they think that uh, one of the interesting criticisms of the United States of care that we've heard from the left is that uh, the board is made up of mostly of healthcare leaders like you and given how ensconced the healthcare uh, organizations are in the system, how could they possibly upset the status quo? So how do you respond to that criticism? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think first I have to remind everybody that we are a nonprofit community hospital. There are many, many kinds of hospitals in the country, but we've chosen to stay as a community hospital with our number one goal to provide exceptional care with compassion. So we approach our work every day from the perspective of meeting the needs of our community, not trying to make money. We are very sensitive to the fact that um, billing practices in hospitals are confusing. We've uh, done a lot of work with transparency to try to explain to our patients and their families that we have lots of opportunities for people who cannot pay so that they can they can receive high quality care. We, um, we do understand that when you get a bill from a hospital, it's horrifying. And there's always that adjustment thing if you have insurance that nobody understands. And there's always the opportunity to argue about why something costs so much money. 
So I think what we've done as, as, as the hospital industry is we've acknowledged the fact that we have to fill the gap for people who just don't understand why bills are so high and ultimately the insurance companies and, and in, in um, Arizona, which is also a Medicaid expansion state, we have um, done incredible things with covering the people in our state who could not previously have gotten care. I think connecting to the United States of Care for us has been um, an incredible opportunity for our voice to be heard because uh, at the end of the day, healthcare is local. And the choice that you make to drive to a hospital when you need emergency care and um, our 100,000 people a year who come to our emergency department make a decision to get there quickly and they count on us to give them um, exceptional care with compassion. So we know that healthcare is local and that numbers and arguments ultimately turn into people and those people turn into the faces that we see every day when we take care of them and they live in our community. And so our goal in healthcare at the local level is to do that every day on the ground and to stay connected to organizations that can help us have a voice at a national level. Mm -hmm. okay. So Andy, you've got this terrific uh, group of people, not just those here, but you've got what, 50 or so people uh, on, your, on your Founders Council. How do you mobilize them to try to move things in the direction that you want to. So first, let me just clarify yeah. who the, that group is. Yeah. There are some well-known people like the, like the group up here, uh, but it's, it's the largest uh, number of people are patients or patient advocates. There are care providers like, like Judy, who's, Judy Rich, who's a nurse. Uh, all are nonprofits. There's no for-profit uh, and, and no, nobody who is part of uh, kind of the intermediate, intermediary sector that would have to potentially get disrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but only people, you know, it would, no matter what kind of system we have, you're gonna need a Tucson Medical Center to touch patients and deliver care to patients every day. So the, the, we, we felt it would be problematic to have people that would be vested in um, a status quo system that, uh, that wouldn't work. So I just think that's important uh, to clarify. I'd also say that uh, not everybody has to agree, and I think you'll find that of the 70 or so people, there's some people that agree, that are passionate about disability rights and disability advocacy, and that's their issue, and that's the issue they care about. That's the issue they bring to the table. Um, there are people who are, I'm quite sure if you talk to us long enough, you'd find areas where we disagree. So the point isn't to come with a consensus. The point is to bring a set of people and resources and energy that can go into uh, a state and allow us to solve problems and punch above their weight class. I'll give you an example. There's a state, a neighboring state, not Arizona, that um, has a proposal where they want to allow everybody in the state to buy into the Medicaid plan. Mm -hmm. It's a great plan, but it is a tough path, and we have essentially taken it on as a project to help them figure out how to do it. One of the questions they've had is, how do we talk to hospitals about this? Uh, Judy got on a phone call Mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the advocates and said, this is how hospitals will think about the issue. These are the questions you need to ask mm -hmm. and answer. It changed their entire approach. So our hope is that we can bring resources, whether policy resources, expertise, uh, to mobilize against very specific goals that we can drive, including grassroots advocacy, policy work, engagement of, of the community, working with legislators. And you know, one of the things that I think may surprise people is that you know, if a legislator has, legislator has a good idea, mm -hmm. let's say they want a, to improve mental health advocacy in their, in their community, or they want to provide better uh, uh, care for people in the first thousand days of their life, um, they don't have any resources to do that. There's no health policy staff. In most states, uh, there's no state health policy staff. There may be a very thinly staffed nonprofit. In California, you've got the blessings of having a California Healthcare Foundation, but in most states, you don't. So coming in and being that bench to help, help them further these ideas, help them get them done, and help them commit to getting them passed is something that the people on our staff have a real passionate about, passion for. So um, I think we will see um, progress over the next few years that we'll be able to look at and measure. But importantly, this is, a, this is about playing the long game and changing the country forever. So this is a lot about taking on things 
that make progress for people today, that solve problems for people today, but that we can then learn from and say, see, we've got some evidence-based solutions that we can take and make work, hopefully at some point in Washington when we've got an administration that has that as their goal. Okay. And you mentioned other states as being some models. We've talked about Romney Care in Massachusetts. You were referring to a neighboring state, which I believe is Nevada. N New Mexico. Oh, New Mexico is yeah, there, Mexico. there for, that, for that particular thing. Uh, great. Other panelists have other states where, that they've seen do things that uh, might be worthy of emulating. I think you start with the fact that there are, at least currently, mm -hmm. there are um, what you might call red states. Mm -hmm. And these are people who genuinely believe that the federal government is overdoing entitlements, overdoing welfare, overdoing a whole lot of things. And they have this almost, um, and it isn't knee jerk, it's, it's an intellectual belief mm -hmm. their representatives have that they're doing the right thing by restraining federal power. Then you have the blue states like our states, mm -hmm. you know? And this is the place, if you wanna go and find out who really could help both the federal taxpayer and state taxpayers make, get more for their money, you'd come to states mm -hmm. like ours to affect Medicare, to affect the tax policy, and a lot of things like that, and listen to people like Sandra. In between are the purples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they haven't quite made up their mind which way to go. So. As far as we're concerned, I, th I would suggest, and we'll talk about this in Minnesota in a couple of weeks, um, one, of the, one of the major factors that's missing are the people that are helping, have been helping all of us pay the bills, i.e. employers and union organizations who used to be able to be out in front on a lot of reform issues. But that whole employer community has a huge stake in making something work in healthcare. And so I think in whether it's purple, red, or blue states you're talking about, that is going to be a factor in influencing in the, our ability, at least, to, to have an influence on, mm -hmm. on the future. One thing the senator raises that I think is worth pointing out, which is that in states that have expanded Medicaid, um, where you've been able to reduce uncompensated care and where the cost shifting to other parts of the market have been significantly reduced by virtue of expansion of Medicaid. And by the way, we've expanded Medicaid now all but 19 states. We've got states now where the popular vote are putting initiatives on the ballot to go vote. I think Medicaid programs are very, very well supported in the country. Democrats, Republicans, and independents, not quite alike, but certainly uh, true. And so the, uh, the Medicaid programs, I think, have done a lot around reducing cough shifting in the hospital settings uh, and in helping to reduce some of the uh, yeah. impact on the employer sector. So it's, it's really important to look at the ACA and, and the rest of the market in totality and recognize that there have been quite, quite significant, well-documented uh, advantages for states that have, uh, have decided to expand Medicaid through the ACA. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the big picture in US healthcare, you've got employers that pay for something like half of all healthcare for people. You have Medicare, which is a national program, of course, you ha and the VA and the, the Defense Department and so forth. And you have the, uh, the marketplace, the, the uh, Affordable Care Act marketplaces, which they get a lot of attention. They're actually fairly small, right? That's right. 10, 50 million people, something like that. The other big number is Medicaid, which is, a, as you say, a big number. And um, some people would say that the attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act was the best thing that ever happened to Medicaid because it's more popular than ever. And you're seeing it, as you say, on ballots and mm -hmm. all over the, across the country. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm getting, what I'm getting at is Medicaid, which most people may know, is, is jointly paid for by the feds and the states. Okay, so this is the place where the states arguably have the most impact, right? So if we're saying, uh, if, if you're predicting that anything that's going to happen in the next few years on health care reform that's meaningful is more likely to happen at the state level, does that mean it's more likely to be a Medicaid reform? And what are those reforms? Is it primarily just expansion, which as you say has happened in many states already? Or what can we envision happening at the state level over the next few years? Well, let me talk about the ballot initiatives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unless, yeah. you know, there, there are very states that you would not necessarily think of as liberal bastions like Idaho and Utah 
and Nebraska, who's had, who have had ballot initiatives where more people have signed petitions to get Medicaid expansion in the state than will benefit from the Medicaid expansion. And people willing, people in these very red states saying that they are willing to, um, to have some sort of payment mechanism, some sort of tax or some other payment mechanism that will cost them in order to make sure that instead of waiting for people to show up in the emergency room with stage three cancer, they can see a doctor when they need to and they can take their kids to the doctor when they need to. This is, so this is not just public opinion. This is people, these are people in the deepest of the red states mm -hmm. who are fundamentally taking action in their hands. And so we are, we are not certainly principally responsible for any of that, but, the, but we are um, essentially working to try to help the people in those states and a, a group called the Fairness Project, which is really driving a lot of those initiatives you know, into those states. There are, so me Medicaid is actually a great platform because every state has it. And it's something that has a very comprehensive benefit set, mm -hmm. and it's a great potential solution. But, but look, I think, um, I know you want to dive into the how, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's a great, important set of questions. But I think um, the, the most important thing, I think, at this level are not all of the hows. It's a complex healthcare system. Um, there's a lot of room for a lot of conversation about that. But fundamentally, commitment to doing this uh, our commitment is, and as I said to our team, is if I can raise $100 million and bring together the resources of the best people in healthcare to help you with a goal of within a decade making sure that every American no longer has to worry about paying for medical uh, care again and get, get access to a regular source of care for their families, can you deliver it? And that really is the mandate. And the team's been at it for six months. Uh, and I think um, they are uh, busy learning, uh, and I think people like us are here to support them uh, as they get through that. But every few months, I think we will learn more and more and more. One thing is, I think, interesting about it all is that as pessimistic as you might be when you look at the federal dialogue, when you look at Washington, when you look at the administration, when you look at all of the things that are being done to try to take care from people, when you get a couple layers beneath that, mm -hmm. And you look, even in these red states, there is a tremendous amount of positive energy towards trying to solve this problem once and for all. Okay. Well, uh, so we're hearing a lot about this can be, is most likely done at the state level. I want to look at this from a, a bigger overall picture and maybe talk about what I think of as a bit of an elephant in the room. And Jude, I'm going to start with you on this one. Because we always talk about healthcare, uh, rightfully, about what it should be able to do for patients. That's true. However, it's also important to know that healthcare is a huge employer, right? It's one in 11 jobs in America. It is predicted to uh, supply one third of all new jobs in America over the next decade. That's a big deal. And as we've talked about, a lot of the problem in healthcare, maybe the biggest problem is how expensive it is overall, which causes us to have fewer people covered. Okay, two thirds of the cost of healthcare is labor. And that's mostly American labor. We don't import a lot of healthcare labor from overseas. I mean, they're, they're, that's American dollars. So doesn't that mean, Judy, that if we really want to talk about solving some of these problems, which are cost problems, we're going to have either fewer jobs or jobs that pay less. Hospital prices are going to have to come down. Doctors are going to have to be paid less. How can we possibly solve this problem without tackling this real issue? Well, we live with this every day in the hospital business. Um, and I would, I would argue a little bit about your two thirds. We've been able to really get it to be about 50% of our costs. Now, on any given day, I could tell you it's because the medical devices cost so much that it's driven down the percentage of the labor costs. But I think um, in, in Arizona, it really was the issue that um, ultimately got our Republican governor to support the expansion of Medicaid, was she understood the economic driver and the jobs that were at stake in a state that was really hit hard by the recession. And every day we can make the case to our community about how many jobs are, are given to people in healthcare. And they're highly educated people. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just um, low paying jobs, although hospitals employ many, many people at minimum wage. 
to do uh, many of the housekeeping and food service kinds of things, but they get benefits. They get good benefits because they work for a healthcare employer, and that's an economic driver. And then, of course, we have a lot of physicians and a lot of nurses and a lot of people technically. And so we have to do our part by um, producing good outcomes. Our length of stay is an outcome that we are being measured on, that we are pushing down. Um, in health in hospitals so that people don't stay as long so the costs don't go up. And our quality measures are um, really being driven nationally that we have to prove that we are not doing harm to patients when they're hospital when they're in the hospital. So it's our burden to prove that we can provide high quality care for lower cost. Uh, years ago, not that long ago, 10 years ago, hospitals would lament the fact that they could not make any money or any uh, money for expansion on Medicare. We now know how to do that. Yeah. So we have taken on learning that Medicare pays us a fixed rate, and for that fixed rate, we can pay our expenses and our staff. So I think it's, it's a constant challenge for the hospital business, and I think we're passionate about rising to that challenge. Okay. There's certainly no way around the, the fact that if we are going to improve the cost picture, we're going to have to figure out how to save costs, and that's going to come out of somebody's pocket. Yes. Or another, right along the way. Well, not surprisingly, I've got tons of questions here. First of all, thank you to the audience for all your wonderful questions. I can promise you I will not get through them all, <laughs> but I'm trying to combine some of them, and there's tons of questions that have to do, not surprisingly, with single-payer health care. <laughs> and I want to ask that question, I think, both of Sandra on a state level, since it's a big issue here, and Andy, on a national level, um, uh, Sandra, I'll start with you. Uh, as I think most people know, California has a single payer in the offing. It's been discussed. We had a program here at the Commonwealth Club about a month ago, a debate about single payer in California. And I'll think, I think one of the things that we came away with is, boy, it's hard to do single payer nationally. In some ways, it's harder to do it on a state level because you need permission nationally and so forth. But what's the status of single payer either in California or in other states? Is that a possibility? Well, I, I think that um, California has had a very uh, vigorous debate about what that might mean. How would you define it? How would you pay for it? Um, I think what is clear in California is that there is broad both political policy and uh, the residents of the state believe that we should absolutely cover everybody. So the universality aspect of single payer, I think there's a North Star for that and uh, a lot of movement towards that in a legislature and an incoming gubernatorial administration. We'll see how that plays out, but uh, if Gavin Newsom leads, um, there'll certainly be ongoing movement. It's important, by the way, distinction to make, because I want to underscore that many people confuse single-payer and universal coverage. And of they course, do. you can have universal coverage without, without single-payer, single right. and some right. people think that's an easier lift. Right. So, so the other point, though, that has already been made is that um, a, a lot of the way we pay for health care today in California are through federal public dollars, whether that's Medicare or Medicaid uh, or subsidies on the exchange. Um, and so uh, doing single payer as a standalone state uh, would be quite challenging from all that perspective in terms of getting all those sign-offs. That said, um, there are some very important experiments that have occurred in California that I think are noteworthy. Uh, among them are voluntary efforts by, for example, our public programs, Medi-Cal, um, uh, the Exchange Covered California, and CalPERS, who came together and decided to work voluntarily as three public agencies. If you do the math on that, there's a million and a half people in the exchange, there's another million people or so in CalPERS, there's 13 million people in Medicaid. And so when public entities come together in sort of these multi-purchasing multi uh, alliances, um, you can drive a lot of unnecessary care down. Uh, you could set targets and goals with regard to quality measures. So we've done some great work in the state, for example, in reducing unwanted pregnancies, uh, uh, unwanted um, C-sections and unnecessary C-sections. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of work in the opiate arena. arena. Um, and so I think uh, the public entities that are large and effective in the state um, are ones that we should look at as foundational for potentially thinking about what the state might do. Covered California has got value-based contracting. 
That's something we'd like to see happen in Medicaid, a movement from uh, contracts that pay, that aren't based on incentives, uh, and that aren't based on value. Uh, we'd like to see a shift in that. So I think there are a lot of things that California can do to move forward and leverage the public programs that exist now, either in voluntary ways or in more robust and more formal ways. So again, in the long game scenario, um, you can imagine building on things that we have seen have been very successful, just pure leaders coming together and say we should work on these things together, potentially doing things that are more formal and using what we've learned on value-based purchasing and incentivizing the right kinds of care and the right kinds of outcomes. So Let me, if I may, just yeah. remind the Californians in the room, all of whom I <laughs> sure are Californian, yeah. um, not to give up. Mm -hmm. And you make the great point about the real issue is coverage. Um, if the Democrats wanted to do government-run health care or, you know, single-payer health care or something, they could have done it. They made every single Democrat walk the plank on Obamacare to say, we can build a better American health system. We can build a better American health system than the one we have. And it would be ill-advised, I would say, as a Minnesotan, <laughs> that, uh, who has a home in California, but mm -hmm. that, <laughs> don't give up. Oh. I mean, it was only politics that got in the way of the pot really realizing the potential that all of everybody here has been talking about. Mm -hmm. So we gotta get back to that. Okay. Well, Andy, I know you have not necessarily been a, an advocate of moving to a full single-payer health care system here in America. Uh, I don't think that's the right characterization. Okay. Well, uh, correct <laughs> me then. <laughs> if you'd asked me two years ago whether or not uh, we would ever have single-payer in this country, I would have said that's a really low probability. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that anymore by a long shot. And in fact, if you go back to the ACA, if it wasn't for Joe Lieberman, Every American would have the option right now to buy into Medicare, mm -hmm. and we would be talking about taking an even further step. It was that close, and don't so don't don't think that it wasn't. I was on a, one of the most uh, one of the things that I think really showed me where we really are as a country is last year I was going around mostly talking in Republican districts and talking to as this Obama guy trying to talk to people about why we should preserve what we have and build on it. And I was on this right-wing radio show, and I don't say that pejoratively, the host described it to me as a right-wing radio show, I kid you not. And he told me, he said, I'm the most conservative person you'll probably ever talk to in your life, and I'm for single payer. <laughs> and I said, really, tell me why. And he said, because I've, now that I've watched through this repeal debate, everything that's going on, and I realize how broken the system is and how exposed it is, and how much greed there is, and how much the system works for everybody except the patient, I just want a do-over. I just want a complete do-over. <laughs> and I think that sentiment is stronger than even a couple people clapping. I think that sentiment, um, and I think that sentiment is not on the left or the right or the center. I think that sentiment is people who are desperate because they fear they're not gonna be able to afford their drug the next time they're at the drugstore. They fear and so they want something to change, and they, and they are ready for that change to be more radical than I think mm -hmm. they ever thought before. Mm -hmm. And it is easier at the federal level because, simple reason, you, can pay, you have pay-fors. Mm -hmm. You have things that you can use in the federal budget mm -hmm. to make these kinds of things happen. Now, a couple of things just, it, will not, it does not happen automatically. It, it takes a lot of mechanics and a lot of decisions and a lot of political will mm -hmm. in order to get there. There are lots of questions. This is not saying, do you want single payer or do you want universal coverage? is isn't like saying, do you like the red grapes or the blue grapes? It's like an designing an entire city. And there, there's very important questions like, should it be illegal for employers to offer coverage to their employees? Under some versions of single payer, it's illegal. Under other versions, it's not illegal. There are questions around, in, in single payer countries, there are supplemental health insurance, private health insurance that goes on top of things. There is a whole series of questions and I would advise uh, people who are um, very strongly now 
viewing the change to be much more transformational, um, that it is time to engage on those things and engage with people on those things and not to run uh, from, those, from those things. But I think the energy, particularly among young people, is very high. Mm-hmm. The big political question, of course, is in 2020, there is probably at least a 50% chance that the Democratic standard bearer is going to be running on a single-payer platform. Don't know if they will or if they won't, but that is going to be a political conversation that I think will be very loud, very visible within the Democratic Party, and I think there will be uh, people saying that uh, it's not a good idea, there will be people saying that it's a good idea, but quite honestly, um, it is a debate that, um, that I think we have to find a way to have beyond just the politics of the moment and the politics of the issue. It's a debate that we need to um, uh, really join in the, in, the, in the very real sense that if we don't solve this problem, we don't solve it significantly for the majority of people uh, and, and soon for everybody, uh, we will uh, have so much more uh, frustration in this country, and I think people won't stand for it. Mm-hmm. So my question on the single payer side is always, uh, given what a heavy lift it is to change the whole system, and given, as, as uh, Senator Durnberger says, that it seems like the biggest issue is coverage, getting everybody covered, um, are we more likely to achieve that coverage by making the big change of single payer or by figuring out other ways to do it incrementally? Even uh, one of the questions here was about, is it more likely to solve that problem at its state level, multiple states solving it? Look, I, I mean... I, I have been in the business of thinking a person at a time and overseeing the implementation of the ECA. We have three states today that are at near universal coverage. We have 47 to go. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Texas that has 20% uninsured rate. Arizona, if you make more than $3,000 a year, you can't qualify for Medicaid. Well, now you're getting a good debate going. Yeah. I mean, that is a good debate. <laughs> yeah. right. Texas and Florida. Texas. You know, dragging big anchors through this whole system and causing people in California sh- who shouldn't have to argue for a single payer to, to argue for a single payer out of desperation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Uh, by the way, we got one. Just thing. on the just to note that for those folks in the audience who are listening to us who would like to look at the analysis, CHCF did uh, commission. A, what are the questions that would need to be answered for a single payer in a state like California? And that's on our website. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it goes through a number of the questions that you would have to ask, many of those that Andy are alluding to. Uh, and it's worth doing that because if you think about what the path is there, those are the kinds of questions that would need to be answered. Great. I would recommend that resource. And Senator, after your team did all that work, did you come away feeling that single payer would be more likely to happen in California? or nationally? You know, I, uh, I take a very long view of, of um, this uh, reform, a path to reform and path to universality. I do think California is a lead train. There's no question about that. Uh, there were two bills in the legislature uh, that would have expanded coverage uh, to the remaining uninsured in California. Uh, didn't make it through this legislature at this time, but um, I I do think that states like California will continue to evolve and innovate uh, and move that conversation along. Where it ends up politically, uh, I I, I don't know that I know for sure and when we will get there, Um, but I definitely feel like uh, California is a place where you know, we're grappling with all of the kinds of questions. And if you look at the state budget, um, this question about how much money do you spend on health care and what is the trade off and what you don't spend on education, and a state that has a very large and sizable uh, uh, population that lives in poverty, um, those are really important trade offs to understand. And so, how do you finance it? Uh, and, uh, uh, and how do we optimize our workforce? I mean, uh, the question you asked, Judy, I think is a really important one. Healthcare is an enormous part of the economy in California. And so um, how do we maximize and think about the future workforce that we need for the state? What, what, how do we design it and how do we train for it? Uh, again, with an eye towards affordability. So I think uh, you should, we should continue to look at California in that space. Um, we're going to make progress on universality. I have no question about that. We need to make progress on affordability. And the last piece that I think we haven't talked about yet that we would be remiss to not mention 
uh, is the incredible unmet need we have in the space around behavioral health. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another area that the entire country uh, understands that uh, we are not meeting the needs of our uh, populations. Um, uh, we certainly don't have parity. Uh, we have um, a, a, a very convoluted, fragmented uh, funding streams. Uh, in California, we, we provide care in uh, certain ways for people who are seriously mentally ill. We put the responsibility of that in, on other entities. If you're not seriously mentally ill, we have very complex uh, uh, funding streams to actually do what people want, which is to be able to get seamless care for all of their needs in one place. We don't have nearly the workforce we need in behavioral health. It's still very stigmatized uh, 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 conditions in many cases. And so there's a tremendous amount of work to do, again, in the spirit of what does the public say and need and what does the data and evidence suggest. That's an area that, you know, you can gloss over uh, some of these things, but that's not one that I think we should gloss over as a country or as a public. We it, have a tremendous amount of work to do. It's really space. important that we support California or Vermont or Maryland and figure out how to get the resources to make it work for a, a kind of a strategic reason, but also a very tactical reason. Um, the strategic reason is the alternative is that we'll end up with a, with a healthcare system designed by a think tank that has only been done in a PowerPoint presentation or on a whiteboard, <laughs> and, and it'll work perfectly, and we will have no idea what the unintended consequences are. So we need to really see that. But the very tactical reason is because we need the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, everybody in here probably has gotten way too familiar with what they do, um, to have something to point to and to score, some evidence. Right. And if you don't have that, then all these proposals will get scored extremely conservatively. And so, you know, I think it's, when I talk about the fact that um, to get to, whether it's single payer or some other vision of a solution, it takes a lot of mechanics to make it happen. Um, this is what I'm talking about. Giving, uh, giving some, getting something done in a state that the CBO can then say, see, we can then use that to, to, to demonstrate cost savings to get it done. Otherwise, you know, we, we will get there and you get tripped up at the goal line, whether it's Joe Lieberman or whether it's a CBO or whether it's anything else, those are things that are important for us to be able to play towards. Great. Well, let me make a provocative statement. I'd like Judy to respond to it first. Uh, so we know Ver Vermont, uh, the governor was behind single payer health care. That state had passed, but they were unable to implement it because of the funding. Right now, we have a lot of energy behind single payer in California. The funding is clearly the hang up. Uh, Coloradans voted down single payer. There are other issues around that, but clearly funding is a big issue. So it's pretty easy for us. And the, the so-called Affordable Care Act, the, the biggest criticism I've heard of it is it didn't really make care more affordable. I mean, you can argue that a bit, but still, we haven't done a great job. We've done a better job of expanding coverage than we have of tackling the cost monster, and that's because you've got to make hard decisions there. And those hard decisions are going to mean Hospitals will close, perhaps. Hospitals will make less money. Doctors will make less money. Drug companies, everybody will make less money in the system. And that's us making less money because it's one out of 11 jobs. So, Judy, I guess where I'm getting around to for you, I've heard differing things, mixed feelings among health systems executives, for example, about the notion of single payer. They like the notion of having more coverage, like the notion of, of eliminating uncompensated care. They're pretty nervous about how much they get paid and how they get paid. What are your thoughts about it? That's a really hard question. Um, so I'm going to take a crack at it. I think um, we always believe that the bureaucracy and the um, paperwork and the hours of uh, feudal work that, re that is required now in the healthcare system could be better deployed. Mm -hmm. And depending on who you talk to, if it's the guardian of, I like the way it is now, then that's the hospital CEO who doesn't want to, to go there. If you're the guardian of, um, we can do this, we can, we can uh, be better stewards, uh, we can take on the drug companies, which is a huge uh, issue for us in healthcare because their, their costs are exponentially going up so much faster than hospital costs are. Um, and we've been able to prove that over the last few years since 
the Affordable Care Act that the actual hospital costs are going up at a much slower rate than medical devices and drugs. And so at the end of the day, corporations and hospital CEOs make a lot of money. And I have been on the, on the edge of that, and the CEOs in California were on the billboards here. I'm sure all of you remember that. Um, and we have to come to terms with the value that we deliver to our communities. It always comes back to who are you accountable to? You're accountable to the patient, you're accountable to the community that you live in, and we have to be good stewards and we have to fight the battle with um, the, our own segment of responsibility and we have to fight the battle with, um, with drug companies and device companies. And whether or not single payer will give us the ability to do that remains to be seen. But we, we can't guard what we have and protect it when so many people cannot afford health care. And that's becoming a louder cry now than it was two years ago. So I'm encouraged. Well, certainly one of the, uh, for me, encouraging signs from the Trump administration, and this, this predates the Trump administration too, is uh, a, a desire to change the way that we pay for health care in particular. They, the watchword is, you know, from volume to value, not just for each piece of work done. Not only but, does it predate the Trump yeah. administration, it was part of the ACA. Yes, exactly. Very well. Very well. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. So, and, 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 it and, was the ACA. Yes, and, and actually, actually, it's notable that in this era of bitter, by, uh, bitter partisanship, that, what was it, 2015, the macro law passed, so-called law, which had a lot of volume to value things there. I should mention, too, earlier this year, very quietly, back in February, Congress passed and the president signed a, 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 a significant health care bill, the Chronic Care Act, that's got some really good stuff in there. And I think because I, maybe it's because the media is more interested in the food fight, but there wasn't a lot of discussion about, hey, that was bipartisan. There are some things happening. What can we learn? David, maybe I'll start you with this. What can we learn from this small number but of still significant bipartisan successes we've had in the last couple of years? Well, to, to get everybody to ask the question <laughs> that you asked at the beginning, which is, how do we pay for it? Uh, I don't think th the way in which hospitals, doctors, and a whole lot of other people in the health system have been rewarded for doing what they know they could be and should be doing makes any sense. And it begins way back when Medicare and Medicaid was passed in 65, and the doctors in the hospitals were told, you bill whatever you think, you know, is reasonable, mm -hmm. customary charges. Not only do you bill them, you bill them to our insurance companies, Blue, Cro Cro uh, Blue Cross in the case of the hospitals, Blue Shield in the case of the doctors. And so right off the bat, snip, 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 you take, what is it, 10%, 20%, whatever it is, off the top, that goes to a third party. And when I come to California and I look at these large systems of care that own hospitals and they have doctor groups and so forth and this whole thing, I think about Minnesota. There's seven of them like this. They're integrated care systems. You all know the famous mail system with the tall building and expensive treatments for miracles. But you don't know about the mail system, which covers a whole lot of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And that's true all over my state. When the, when the Justice Department came to investigate my hometown area in the middle of Minnesota, 400,000 people, for buying up the last doctor's practice in the area, they also found out that the focus on this system was on population health. Population health. How do we, as a 400,000 uh, 400, people, get healthier, stay healthier? How do we deal with the social problems that are related to healthcare. An ideal, ideal charge for a health system, whether it's Sutter or it's Dignity or it's Kaiser or whatever you want to call it, an ideal charge for a system of care that attracts all these professionals and all this research and so forth into the system. If you could buy, let's say, a five-year membership in this new Sutter Health, or this new Kaiser Permanente that I'm talking about. You buy a membership, 
skip this insurance thing. You buy a membership. Don't you think the incentives would be aligned for both the customers or the consumers or the patient and the people in the system mm -hmm. to do the things that should be done to bring down the cost? So um, that is a, that's the potential that a California has. Mm -hmm. That's the potential that a Minnesota has. That's the potential that only politics stands in the way of Florida and Texas and a few other people like that to get at. So a lot of the answer then may be around payment reform. That's what you're thinking overall. Yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think it would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So Judy, I'll go back to you with that. Let's say we had much more substantial payment reform because we are making this move from volume to value, but it's going pretty slowly. Just saw a study today about- Slower than we thought. Uh, slower than we <laughs> thought. And the amount of the, the system it's really affecting is pretty small currently. Yes. But let's say we do that more successfully. Let's say that the government and the private sector push us much faster in that regard. What does that mean for your hospital? I mean, you certainly have heard people predict that we'd have an awful lot, it would have, we'd have many fewer inpatient days, yes. right, over among other things, and more other things being done. To Sandra's point about mental health, you probably, if you had flexibility, spend more dollars on mental health care since that affects other things. But how would you see that affecting a, a hospital system like yours? Uh, well, it makes us immediately um, worry a lot more about the social determinants of health than about um, the latest, greatest thing that we could do to somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's given us a social conscience that's different than before. Because if we really believe that um, we're not going to get paid um, per click, and we don't get paid per click anymore. I mean, most of you probably know that there's a, there's a set price that we get paid from like Medicare for a diagnosis. And the, the burden is on the hospital now to get the patient out as quickly as possible and not have them come back. So I think there are many incentives in place and there will continue to be more. But the future of healthcare is not inside the four walls of an acute care hospital. The future of healthcare is outpatient. It's in our communities. We're doing things now that we never did before. Uh, one day stays, people come in for surgery and they go home the same day. I'm sure that many of you have experienced that. And it is completely driven by how we're being paid. And we have to be able to reinvest in the part of the business that needs the technology, but we are putting a lot of our time and energy into moving the care out where it can be accessed at a lower rate. It's con completely changing the way we see our business. So even at this level of payment reform, which we've acknowledged is insufficient, it's still getting you there currently. It is, absolutely. Okay. Because our margins, we're, nonprofit hospitals run on one to 3% operating margins. Mm -hmm. And um, there's not a lot of room for, for overspending in there. More question just about on the employer front, since they pay for half of the health care in America, but don't seem to be as active as you might expect in, in, in effecting change and so forth. If we were to move to something that's more, uh, uh, that's more um, universal coverage, and particularly on a single payer basis, does that mean the employer would necessarily be cut out of the equation? And if so, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But I want to tackle that one. Well, as I said, you know, under some plans, yes, yeah, under some plans, about, no. no <laughs> under 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 uh, Bernie's plan, uh, employers would it would be illegal for employers to offer coverage. There's other um, single payer like plans that allow employers to offer coverage and allow people to choose. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that that answer is is necessarily baked in. Uh, people have predicted that employers would be getting out of healthcare for a long, long time. They haven't. I think for uh, it bonds them to their employees as much as they complain about it. Um, you know, it is a particularly in a labor market like we have now, they like uh, to build that relationship. But, you know, I want to go just make sure to, to make a, a point you've been focused on, rightly so, which is, a, which is affordability and cost. And people will, I think, and, and largely a Republican argument, so we can have this conversation, is that we spend too much on health care as a country and it's going to bankrupt us. And, we're going to go, it's going to just cripple the country and it's going to bring us down. And people talk about how we spend 17% of our GDP on health care. And I think when you're supposed to hear that, you're supposed to go, oh my gosh, we spend 17% on health care, as if you're supposed to know what the hell to do with that information. <laughs> Is that too much? Is that too little? I, I, I am personally of the view, maybe the minority view, that 17% is a fine amount to spend on our health care. I'd spend 25% of our, of our GDP on our health care 
we're a wealthy nation that's aging, and we want to uh, invest, if, but we have to do it differently. So all I would argue is let's spend 17, let's spend 20, let's spend whatever we need to spend, but let's spend it the right way. Yeah. Let's invest it in primary care. Let's invest it in social determinants. Let's invest it in cures. There is no better investment than our health. The problem is we don't view it as an investment. It's an expense. And 17% is an expensive expense. It is nothing as an investment. Mm -hmm. Great. Well put. Here, here. Okay. <laughs> we are just about out of time, so I just want one quick word from each of you. It's the very last question, and that is on this. What single issue in healthcare do you think represents the best opportunity for bipartisan progress? You just get a sentence on this, each of you. Judy, we'll start with you. I think it's the personal face. It's the face of the patient. It's the story of the person who had a job and went to work every day and did a terrific job and was suddenly um, diagnosed with something that required um, very expensive care, loses their job, and in one year goes from being a productive citizen to somebody who can't pay their own medical bills. I think that's the single piece for me as a nurse and as a hospital provider. Right. Thank you, Sandra. I completely Good. agree with that. I, I think the unpredictability, the instability, an environment of uncertainty, and never really knowing whether you have uh, the ability to go in and get the care that you need uh, is, is absolutely uh, uh, something that I, I don't think is a partisan issue. Um, I think anybody who, you know, whether you have a car accident or you have a rare malignancy or whether whatever it is, I think there's a general value in this country that everybody should get uh, the right care for that condition at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Senator Gerberger. Just, um, you know, the aging of the population now that I'm one of them. <laughs> I can't wait 10 years <laughs> to solve this problem I keep, I keep talking about. But, uh, you know, if, if we don't start dealing now with health, a healthier population, not because we're ordered to by Obamacare or something like that, but because it's the absolute right thing to do, and you build the incentives on all of us to stay healthy, there, you know, we gonna, are going to reach the point where we're, well, we're already at the point where we're taking money away from education or we're taking it away from something else. Mm -hmm. We're doing that right now. So, so health. You know, right. I don't right. know what else to say about it. Andy, last word. So w one of the reasons why you may not have put value-based care as part of the ACA is because we made a decision in the Obama administration to keep value-based care as non-controversial and as jointly owned as possible. We could have gone around and said when we were going up on the hill, we could have married the two because it was part of the same legislation. But we decided to make a very strategic decision was to say, which is to say, because the ACA is such a hot button issue, let's take as many things as we could and leave them in the category for as long as possible where not one, one side doesn't own the issue. And that's very, very important. Yeah. Because once yeah. it gets owned, the other side instantly gets repulsed by it and then there become all these talking points. So we hosted a dinner in, in DC where we invited any senator or congressperson that wanted to show up from either party and said the only thing is you have to be, want to be willing to get in the room and talk about how to build an agenda that brings coverage to more Americans. And believe it or not, people showed up under the cloak of darkness and anonymity. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, the, and, the, and what you asked was a question I asked that group, and I will leave you with what they said. I asked the group, what are the areas that we can begin to build a common agenda on that aren't owned by either party? And they came up with two mental health, and believe it or not, drug costs. And I think there is, that is a sign that the country really recognizes that these issues now, it is time to move on them, and they supersede politics. That's the job we need to do with all of people's health care. Terrific. Well, I want to thank our panel not only for tonight, but for their commitment to U.S. health care. Andy Slavitt, the former acting administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Senator David Dernberger, the former senior senator from Minnesota. Dr. Sandra Hernandez, the president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation. And Judy Rich, the CEO of Tucson Medical Center. Also want to thank our audiences here in San Francisco, as well as on radio, television, and the internet. 
I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetema Project, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.